I will show you two pictures. Which one would you choose? Now let me ask you one question. Why did you choose one image over the other? Most would describe the first picture as a timeless, romantic, exotic utopia that we would all want to experience. It's something we are automatically attracted to. But why would someone else prefer a neutral, almost bland image? Would you say the scene radiates a calming ambience or perhaps nostalgia? Let's delve deeper into the truth of this image. In the first five seconds of your judgment, you've deduced that this picture, put simply, is absolutely boring. There's nothing to question. There's no color. This place has no significance. There's an absence of local flavor, yet it retains as a large memory for many, portraying a striking sensation. So what is the backstory of this image? This image is what anthropologists name non-places. However, before we begin, let's take a step back. I will take you back into my childhood and explain the potential history of why someone might choose such an image. As a child, I never had many preferences. I was eager, go with the flow, and fairly productive for my age. And I have one specific memory when I was in English class in the first grade, and we were to practice writing an assortment of vocabulary words. The teacher gave us two options, if we'd like to play or work first. Now with the obvious of the bunch, you're a child and it's English class. Tell me, who really enjoys English? So the tender decision maker inside of me immediately chose to get writing, primarily because I enjoyed the effective sensation and correlated that after playing, work would inevitably leave me content at the end of the day. This is different to the majority of other children who seek the vibrancy of immediate gratification, vibrant dolls, colorful toy blocks, and lively balloons, an incomparable rival to the pitiful pen and paper nothingness at last. And perhaps it also stood that as a tender child, you seek that colorful social circle with a sparkling atmosphere. Yet it never lived up to my expectations and I slowly began to appreciate time alone where I could have my own enjoyment without being directly influenced. So what do you think now? Did you choose an image over the other simply because there was more to look at? Or since there's a deep connection between our history and the figures presented in a scene. Non-places are then defined based on what a place is not. They are places that come to existence by being relational and deeply historical and intimately connected to identity. It's where history erupts in the form of landscape. Think of airport terminals, discrete bridges, parking lots, and valleys are great examples of such spaces. Non-places are transitionary places where humans pass through as anonymous individuals, but do not relate or identify within any intimate sense. And as a child, this was so intriguing to me that in such a boring place, anything could occur with deltas of possibility, with no human restriction. For example, in museums, your hand is stamped with ink and your body is marked for security. In hospitals, you wear abnormal patient gowns to be identified with every other patient. In non-places, you are only allowed to follow certain paths. Your movement, gestures, and bodily acts are under surveillance. The nature of non-places fits well with the modern day theory of super modernity, which has become increasingly obsessed with control and security, characterized by impatience and the acceleration of time. In his book, Modernity at Large, American anthropologist Arjun Abadurai explores the boundaries between how we imagine the world that's influenced by our obsession with security and how that imagination influences our self-understanding, modeled by our status quo and their effects on the people who partake in them. In a world where nations seem to be ever more homogenous, yet filled with differences, he forges a path to move beyond traditional oppositions between culture and power, tradition and modernity, pointing out the vital role imagination plays in our idealization of the world for today and tomorrow. Additionally, French anthropologist Marc Auger brings the totality temptation, where culture is imagined as holistic, 
and accurately represented by randomly selected artifacts, individuals, and practices. Think of it as the commonly seen Starbucks emblem, which locates the origin of their coffee at such unspoiled exotic places that we will never seek due to the influence security of our generation. So we ask one question, has society gone mad? Well, first we are confronted with one major discovery. It's the origin of place that is constructed by indigenous fantasies that materialize into day-to-day -day seeings, which are non-places, created by academic restriction and societal objectification. Images as such might be seen as bland or useless, but in that sense, undignifiably liberating. Liberty we crave to achieve, one that we never end up grasping. It's due to the groundless constraint we place on ourselves and how it's been constantly glorified through academic objectification in math. You must only use a certain formula to solve a problem or constantly re-evaluating multiple strategies in English. You must master the perfect structure to develop the best essay to eventually get an acceptable mark. And it's not only the primary demand to be silenced, but how it's been materialized by the never ending fight for freedom combined with the consistent counteractions to it. We envision true freedom as something farther than life, a paradise blushed with palms, unfailingly desired. It's in that psychological last resort that we take a hard grasp on something that pertains no use as a shelter for reconciliation. Envision valleys of a free, soft, thin-like urge, parking lots as forever neutral within the lines. It's a dreamed spontaneity of perfection underneath the bridge where you can finally relax. So what does this say about our society? You chose the first picture because it's our generation's disciplinary practice of producing a romantic version of places as timeless, unchanging, artificial visions that we subconsciously understand are never attainable. It's where humanity alike flocks to immediate gratification and where we draw the line of normality. Had you preferred both images, you would have equally adored the vibrant atmosphere that society and your childhood relishes, though you were easily swayed by temptation and may have transitioned into a liking of the freed neutrality non-places emanate. So the next time you see any place, whether it be our fantasized version of perfection or the psychological parachute we cling to anywhere, we might not ever be able to escape this humanity-consuming restriction. But it's time for us to recognize that these non-places coincide to dictate our history, our values, and what we utmost desire in life. And in that moment, we wake and discover a sensational paradise that humanity once never knew existed. Thank you.